people talk about peace and serenity in my work and so forth. Um, I paint what I like to see. Californian because my, while I was born in Chicago, um, my parents had the good sense to move to California and when I was only four and a half years old. So I grew up, went to school here, worked here all my life. We had, when I was, my sister and I were kids, on a Sunday afternoon the whole family was reading and uh, sometimes you couldn't hear a pin drop. And of course, the reading with me became a, a lifelong habit, and that, that was always not a lot to me. I grew up in Pasadena, and I went to the Pasadena City Schools, and uh, to the grammar schools, and to high school, a little young because I, I skipped a grade, and they thought I wasn't working, getting enough work to do, so they made me take a summer course, which pushed me up a little, so I was, I was just 13 when I went to uh, high school. Good morning, everybody. This is Blaze from the Arts, Culture, and Us, and today I'm here at Toby Moss Gallery on Beverly, and uh, we're here to discuss... The restoration of the uh, History of Transportation mural at the city of Inglewood. Okay, and... Um, who is the great artist that we're here to discuss? Helen Lunderberg. Helen Lunderberg is the creator of it, and uh, the, uh, she uh, was uh, instrumental in every step of the installation. Okay, and how long did you know her? Oh, that well, long. <laughs> ha -ha, I met her long before, uh, not uh, a couple of years before I opened my gallery. So I met her in the mid-70s. Uh -huh. and. Um, I uh, had the pleasure of also knowing her husband for three years, four years before he died. And, and what was his name? Loris Urfeitelson. Okay. Because I, I read in my uh, uh, research that he was like her mentor and her instructor at one point. Tell us a little bit about that to bring us into what we're going to discuss. Well, she uh, graduated and uh, was um, get, got as a, as a graduation gift a, um, a scholarship, a scholarship yes, thank you, to um, the Stickney School of Art in Pasadena. Uh, and uh, she started off with one teacher, but within a couple of weeks, suddenly her teacher was replaced. He went off on a, a vacation, and in came Lars Feitelson, fresh from um, the East I'm Coast. Not knowing very much about what I was doing, but anyway, working away. And the school caretaker, Gabasa, uh, brought this young man in. And he said that Mr. Fireson is going to be our uh, new teacher for the next, next sessions. And so, well, he's, it was a very hot day. He sat down on a bench behind me somewhere and looked at what I was doing, and he couldn't resist coming up and telling me right away where I was going wrong. And well, at first I didn't realize that I was falling in love with my teacher. That was something one didn't do. Uh, 
it's, it's, so it took several months before I realized it. And it took a little bit longer for him to have the nerve to tell me how he felt. And that was it. Um, that was something that went on all the rest of so, our lives. So let's talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about uh, her post-surrealism painting. Well, post-surrealism is an, a term that was uh, coined in the 30s. Uh, surrealism is a movement from uh, Europe of the 20s, and it um, really talked about uh, the creation of images that were beyond control. They simply emerged from the brain and directed the hand. A post-surrealism was a Loris Rufaitels and Helen Lunderberg creation. Really? Uh, proposition, and that was um, that, it, probably about 1932, 33. They began to talk about it. By 1934, it was named post-surrealism. 1933 was also the year when when Lester and I began to really formulate the idea of of a new classicism. We distinguished between the kinds of paintings that could be called subjective classicism or the new classicism. Uh, and one kind we called idea entity, the other mood entity. Now, my um, first mirror painting belongs to the mood entity category because it doesn't ex that's an idea that it, it, it puts forth a mystery. Another painting, which I guess would fall into the idea entity category, is the por double portrait of the artist in time. I was playing with, with infancy and adulthood, and the central figure in the foreground is a child about two years old which I did from a baby portrait that had been made of me. I still have it. And by painting the, the infant as, as real and smiling and holding a little budding flower in her hand and throw, casting a shadow from her to the wall back of her and up the wall and overlapping a self-portrait I had done earlier, I was sort of playing with time in, in reverse, as it, as it were, as if, as if the, sh the infant shadow forecasts the adult. This painting, which is called Microcosm and Macrocosm, shows you the microcosm here is blown up by a microscope to show all these little creatures in it. And here's a further blow up, and here's, a, here's a, an enlargement of one. And the, the little glass in the hand of the, of the figure here as a sort of symbol for the microscope and, and the telescope. So here we come to some macrocosm, and here is the blow up of one of these tiny things, which is Saturn. I don't know what else to say about it, except I'm sort of fond of this one. Finally, uh, they uh, developed uh, this process of petrochrome, uh, petrochrome, which were natural colored stones that were used in a mosaic. They could take the natural colored stones and create your composition. Um, no, wait, 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 wait. You don't just go outside and find natural colored stones, no. do you? No, <laughs> but they... In but other words, if they wanted to do a, a work like this, they'd find stones this color or shade. Yes, in nature there By are the way, we, we want to mention this is one of her works oh, a little yes. later on. We'll talk about, about her various styles a little later on, but just during the scene if well, you have this here, I want to point it out so they can take a look at sure. it. Sure, the mural is before this painted. So, what is the name of this? To me, it looks like the rock. What is well, the name it of is it? The Shadow of the Rock. Ah, The Shadow it of the Rock. It has a special mood, the Helen Lunderberg mood. I love it. Uh-huh, so do I. Love it. It's a beautiful piece. Yeah. Okay. So just so they'll know, this is some of her work. We were sitting here, and we're again. I want to point out we're at uh, Toby Moss's 
uh, gallery uh, <laughs> right here on Beverly, close Bo to uh, Beverly Boulevard. Be Beverly Boulevard, close to La Brea. And the whole little strip, we'll, we'll mention that, is a, a whole lot of little galleries. Oh, yes. It's so beautiful over here. Yes. It really is. <laughs> we have an art community here. Yeah, and you said something about restaurants and all that. Oh, my goodness. Such good restaurants. The best restaurants in the city. <laughs> okay, so some of the people want to come and take a look. And later on, we'll, we'll shoot a few of the um, paintings in here. You know, uh, people that watch my shows, why we call it the arts, culture, and us, because I love to go to galleries and museums, and I really appreciate mm -hmm. you. What's the name of the group restoring the... The uh, mural? Well, there's no real name to it. It's simply called the, uh, re the uh, conservation, the restoration of the uh, history of transportation mural by the city of Inglewood and it's Inglewood who's been the moving force for it. Mm -hmm. uh, curiously enough, um, before this project started, uh, at least before it took form, I had felt the need to do this very thing. Um, I had um, hired a, a director and a film, a, a cameraman, and um, an editor and a, a support staff and we developed a, a film, a video, of Helen, uh, starting with her early life and going through the Federal Arts Project. And uh, it sounds to, like a to, great movie. It is. Well, it's it's pretty good. It, it's it's. I will have to say that I think that it needs a little re-edit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we, I did um, publish a uh, a video of this, and it includes. Uh, some a segment of Helen walking d along the wall. We took a little caravan over to uh -huh. to the park, to Sentinella Park, where it was at that time, and uh, she walked down the wall and told about how she was had been involved with it, and we talked about the images, um, and we got some wonderful shots. Mm -hmm. uh, curiously enough, about six weeks after that, uh, some some kid stole a car oh, and rammed it into the uh, uh, section of the wall uh, so that a couple of the panels were severely damaged, mm -hmm. which has all been taken care of now because we had the original sketches to yeah, go by. I saw them. I think I have that on film a little yeah. bit. Too. So um, that film is also a very nice record. In fact, I think it's the only, <coughs> the only record of Helen uh, talking. I've been asked what I thought about the Federal Art Projects many times, and I must say that for me it was a wonderful thing. It, it, it enabled me to earn a living, to pursue my profession, and while what I did for the project was what the project wanted, I had time on, of my own in the evenings and weekends to, I, I, I continued to paints and both surreal paintings. Other murals that I designed for the art project were done in a medium that was, I think, invented by, by uh, the people at the project. It was the use of, of um, colored cement and, and aggregate or crushed stone, uh, such as is used for terrazzo floors and so on. project uh, and given a subject uh, by the, uh, then the head of the mural department, Mr. Fidelson. And I presume that he had talked to the Englewood people and this is what they wanted, a history of transportation in this area. And it goes from the Indians down there to airplanes. They used a technique that's used for making uh, terrazzo floors but uh, done in such a way that it could be, could be laid down on, uh, on uh, masonite panels, four by eight, I think this is standard size, and poured from the back. And then when the whole thing is solidified, it was polished. Now, it looked very nice. It looks faded to me now because it's had no polish in 40 years, I guess.
I, I guess this show, you know, the show is 28 and a half minutes long, and so I'm certain that we've done more than enough, but I do want to give the opportunity if there's anything else you can relax and think. Is there anything else you'd like to say or any well, other? Well, I, I could say that because of my um, acquaintance with Helen and Lorser, long before I thought about opening my gallery, I began to realize that in American art history, the art history was largely written about the artists and art uh, institutions on the eastern seaboard, where all the publishers and the press and the galleries, where all the art scene was considered to be. And nobody went west of the Hudson River. And um, I knew that California, Los Angeles particularly, had a thriving creative art center and that many of the art that was being shown in New York had been really created in California by California artists who felt that they had to go to the Eastern Seaboard to be discovered. <laughs> so I channeled my gallery from uh, originally five centuries of prints and drawings to focus upon the history of, of, of art in Los Angeles from approximately 1930s to the present. Um, in 1930s, I picked because of the creative changes that took place, such as post-surrealism, mm -hmm. and because it was the beginnings of abstraction, uh, of departing from the uh, traditional um, uh, Hudson River School uh, and uh, California Impressionism. It's that crispness, that new vision, that pushing out of the barriers that Hel that Lorser Feidelson came here for originally and which extended from the 30s on. California is a very creative place that everything you see around you is by an artist of California, created in California, and um, it's, the, it's the seedbed of the creativity for today. Most of the work in this room, I'm just looking around, I'm gonna is from the 30s. Hold on one second. Uh, this is John right. McLaughlin. This is Leonard Edmondson. Leonard Edmondson. And That's right. William Dole. Which one up here? The two up top there. Oh, uh, I do see the symbol. Let me get them both. Here. Gordon Wagner did the assemblage there to the right. And um, what do you call it? that's right. Look at that. That's really one of the er that? early. That's, that's, from the, that's from the late 50s, 1959 60. He was a great figure in California assemblage movement. I'm looking at that picture. I remember everybody used to have a picture of their grandmother like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> their and then Lee Mulliken uh, did the impersonator right here. That's a marvelous piece. Lee Mulliken. And uh, his, uh, there was an exhibition of his of work, a one-person show at the L.A. County just this last year. And here is uh, David Levine. That's a piece from the 30s. Ooh, that's beautiful. And John McLaughlin. I need to take a vacation to that place. Mm -hmm. And John. I John like McLaughlin this. from There's the 1949. Oh, he was very, very important to the hard edge movement of California. There's he and Lorcer so Feidelson yeah. were the real uh, instigators of that, or were the real developers of that. Beautiful. <clears throat> and then below that is Betty Saar. She's uh, being exhibited right now at the Pasadena Museum of California Art, along with her daughter Leslie and um, her daughter Allison. Is a painter as well. Yes, her two daughters are painters and assemblagists. This is Clinton Adams right here. Marvelous is piece. Is he somebody we should know? Well, Clinton Adams was uh, taught at UCLA in the 40s and was uh, present at the beginning, the founding of the Tamron Lithography Workshop. He's very well known as a. a uh, as a lithographer, too. <clears throat> this is Mike Kanamitsu, Matsumi Kanamitsu. I like that. It's, from, it's called Mickey Mouse Blues. Mickey Mouse and it's a, Blues. Yeah, it's a, a guai. Say his name again? Matsumi Kanamitsu. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, he's very fine. As Folks you can see, uh, there are a, a number of pieces here about California. That's Lee Mulliken, and that's Claire Falkenstein, and Peter Shire. This is Peter Shire, yes, his teapot. That's a sketch for a teapot. We're going to have actual fantastic teapots and constructions that are going to be here in November for a one-person so show. In other words, you are committed to the California artists. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's what I focus on. Oh, I almost forgot Inez Johnston is a Los Angeles artist. 
She uh, went to Berkeley in 1948 and came to Los Angeles soon afterwards and has been here ever since. And she creates these mythical, mystical, magical worlds with great narratives. In fact, this is a bronze of hers as well, and a... The, Ooh, this is nice. <laughs> that's a carved wooden piece. That's a green job. Talking green about transportation, I guess this used to be like somebody's bus, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, How unique. Uh, and then we shift into Jay Rifkin. Uh, this is a, a very unique carving of hers, uh, actually an assemblage of, of found pieces and a drawing of hers. You know, I've, I've dealt with several artists that use found junk pieces well, and make yes. art out of That's several That's the basis of, great, of California great assemblage. Great and they say, well, this is found artist. That's right. Oh. <laughs> Intentionally, you know. That's this is beautiful. Reminds me of something of Helen's softness. It has a. It's a very architectonic piece, and really talks about the fact that uh, after her husband walked out on her when she um, had an autistic child to raise, uh, she went to work in a, in a um, uh, an architect's office doing renderings during uh, tr uh, draftsmanship dr during drafting. Yeah. And I um, see the same angle in this piece. That must be hers too, huh? Uh, you no, know, that's Herbert Beyer. Oh, he is a Bauhaus-trained artist who ended up here in Santa Barbara. Wonderful artist as well. Santa Barbara, is that where all the great artists used to live out here? A great, great many. Uh, Peter Krasnow. Peter who? Peter Krasnow. And <laughs> Peter Krasnow um, was an artist who came here in uh, Cali to California in 1922-23. He was a great friend of, of Edward Weston. And he had a, such a unique vision and way of speaking that that's really what identifies California artists, is that they have their own way of speaking. They okay. cannot be mistaken for anyone else's work. And when his work is in exhibition, mm -hmm. uh, in a group exhibition, they have to give him his own corner or his own room. One of that is. All right, that is, this is, Betty, this is Betty Sauer again. And this is uh, uh, a lithograph uh, 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 called L.A. Skies and Spinning Hearts. And it actually has pieces that are in springs that <laughs> spring off the, um, off the surface of the paper. And you can see that it's in a very eccentric shape. And it's actually uh, pieced and sewed, hand sewn. Is it? it yes, there's sewing here. See the sewing? No, I, I never heard of sewing in art before. Well, here you see it. <laughs> this now you is see truly it. Unique. It tells us, first of all, I guess that it's a woman's painting, a <laughs> man, woman's composition, and um, it also talks about her black heritage, and uh, it talks about Los, Los Angeles. Her. Um, I see the pine her, tree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our the, the man who does matting for us loves this. Uh, piece so much and you can see he made a very special mat one that cuts out for all the the portion for all the uh, the projections in her uh, composition it's a wonderful oh, really? piece fantastic. yeah fantastic yeah and see we jump from her to somebody as abstract as laddie john dill laddie john dill creates these um massive pieces in stone and marble uh, so you know what i see well, I you see, see you should have your own show and go around the galleries and just talk about people's work. You do it so great. Well, I, I do like to do that. Yeah. I'm just looking right here. Here are other Californians. Here's Nikki de San Fal, who's really an international artist, but she spent a lot of time here in California and died here just uh, fairly recently. Just so full of life, so buoyant, so fun. Who's this? And this is Nathan right. Oliveira, a great, great artist. Wow. Also a creative of a, of a mood and a space of his own. I haven't seen a head like that since like the 17th century. Well, he's, Paintings. he is, used to be this is modern <laughs> classicism, you know? It's a new way of, of speaking. I love it. And over here is Rico Lebrun. Great Rico Lebrun, who was uh, active in the Jepson School here in the 40s. Now, is, is this his work or print? This is a, a watercolor. This is a gouache. Ah. Um, he actually was with the Federal Arts Project in New York in the 30s, and then came to California. This in is his too? This, this one here. And then came to California in about 1940, 41, and um, 
and was active in Los Angeles, as I say, in the Jepson School, a great teacher, a great leader, and uh, inspired many, influenced many, many artists. Uh, this is Ruth Asawa. Ruth Asawa um, was uh, interned at uh, the Roar Camp in Arkansas, but really grew up here in, some, in California, it looks Los like, Angeles. Looks like coral. Well, it's a form from nature. It's actually a bronze. Oh, but it looks uh, like a piece of coral or something. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. Yes, it is. It's very fine. How unique. And she has uh, one person show just opening up at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art this uh, in November this this year. Okay, this is Blaze, and um, I'm just finishing up a fantastic interview. Uh, it's one of those interviews that's so great. I'm probably gonna have to make an extended copy just for you personally. So I want to thank you very much for having me here. My pleasure. And here we are. And and this is Toby Moss, and we're here on Beverly Boulevard. Uh, this is one of the greatest areas. It's one of these areas where you can come and just walk around, you park your car and walk around, do all kinds of activities. It's, it's thriving. I want to thank you very much. Blaze out. I don't like disorder and confusion or violence. And I know they go on in the world, but why should I have to paint them? If the painting doesn't, doesn't add up to a mood or something, if it, I'm not interested, you see, in doing a purely formal abstract sort of sort of thing it has to uh, say something to me but n not in so many words because I can't put it in words